My name is Norm Volsky, your host, and this is the Digital Health Heavyweights Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Digital Health Heavyweights Podcast with your host, Norm Volsky. Today, this is our first episode featuring two guests. Um, first, we would like to introduce Evan Falchuk, who is currently CEO and founder of Family First. In addition, he was president and COO of Best Doctors for 10 plus years in addition to be chief strategy officer, as well as vice chairman. And in between those two runs, he ran for governor of Massachusetts and also had a law career before getting into healthcare. So welcome, Evan. And Elena um, is currently um, SVP of innovation and strategy at Family First. But before that, she was a senior associate of health and group benefits at Mercer. And most recently, prior to Family First, was the Director of Health and Benefits at Willis Towers Watson, and actually ran all of North America DE&I, and was the leader of that unit at Willis before joining. So, Elena, welcome to the show. Thanks, Norm. Um, You know, a lot of folks watching this podcast will definitely know the best doctor's name, Um, you know, Evan, you're there over a decade, and uh, the company eventually... um, got acquired by Teladoc for a good chunk. And before the merger, you know, you and your team, um, you know, grew it to over 600 employees, over 5 million uh, in revenue about um, at the beginning. And you scaled that to well over 200 million in revenue. So I think a lot of our uh, audience is going to be very interested in how, you know, you and your leadership team built that company. Sweet. That sounds good. So curious, Evan, you know, you started your career as an attorney. You got your JD from UPenn. Um, how did you move from law into healthcare? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that, that I've learned over the years is how important it is to be doing something that you just feel it's not good. It's something that clicks with you where you just feel a sense of I'm doing this because I was it just feels natural to me to be doing that. And I think a lot of folks, you know, when you graduate college or you go to graduate school or whatever, you start working in something because it's the thing to do. It's the next step. It's the next, you know, expectation of what you should do. And I enjoyed being a lawyer, although I have to tell you, I had, I went to law school for absolutely no reason. You know, I had a a guy that I went to college with who was a year ahead of me, who I was competitive with. He said, I'm going to apply to law school. And I said, oh, yeah, you're doing it. I'm doing it, too. Next thing you know, I'm sitting at a desk in Washington, D.C., practicing law for 80 hours a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, I just feel like for anybody that's that's pursuing any kind of career, that the, the key thing is, you know, do something that you feel passionate about. And And for me, the key to it is feeling like I'm building something, creating something that needs to exist. And, you know, that's how I got involved with Best Doctors and and um and it's why i created family first it's why i built the independent political party that i did when i ran for for governor it's um that that's what makes me tick uh, is what i've what i've learned and you just you got it for everybody you know no matter what it is you do just find that and how did you find best doctors you know coming from the law yeah right. no it was i i was fortunate because my father had started best doctors my father was a mm-hmm. Uh, physician. He was a professor at Harvard Medical School, and he had this side project, which was building a, a second opinion business to help people back in his home country, which was Venezuela. Mm-hmm. And it was um, it was small. It was just, it was a few people. And I was after five six years wanting to make the kind of change I was talking about. And and he had said you should just get come come here and you get some mm-hmm. experience doing this. And I did, and I fell in love with it. And then we just started to build it, and it was. You know, to go from a situation a little bit like what we have here at Family First, where you're like, I've got four or five people. Let's turn this into something that everybody, that millions of people around the world can have access to in in meaningful ways. That was my, uh, that's what I saw and and just feel so blessed to have had the chance to do that. Yeah, amazing mission. Uh, You and the team did a just awesome job of building that business and giving a lot of uh, patients access to just great care. Um, Elena, with a BA in econ and anthropology, uh, what brought you into healthcare in general and, and what made you join Mercer? Yeah, I love people and I love numbers. And I always thought I would be 
be in healthcare. I had volunteered mm-hmm. through junior high and high school at a regional level one trauma hospital in St. Paul and learned quickly that environment was not what I was looking for. Um, then in college, I had worked at the Department of Health it's um, through a women's cancer screening program that provided free cancer screenings to uninsured and underinsured women. And I also worked at the VA Medical Center on a study of different methods of effective tobacco cessation for, for veterans. And um, that's where I, I learned that helping underserved communities get access to care was really more my passion. Mm-hmm. Um, what tuned me into Mercer, very similar to Evan, uh, was one of my college roommates, Carol. She was studying to be an actuary and had gotten hired into Mercer's retirement practice. And I, uh, growing, I, from where I came from, didn't have a lot of professional connections when I graduated or really any idea of what I wanted to do. So I was sending my out my resume out in the, in the age of monster everywhere I could. Mm-hmm. Um, and about a month after Carol had gotten her offer, I got a call from Mercer for a role as an analyst in their health and benefits group. And had it not been for Carol, I would have never heard about Mercer. I would have not known any such job existed but I could really tell within the first few minutes of my interview that it was a perfect match for my interests with my love of numbers and helping people and my passions and just a fantastic group of people. And it's still some of my best experiences and friends today. You know, let me, let me I want to just add something because what strikes me being in, in and around insurance for the last you know quarter century is that um, almost nobody, unless they're an actuary, goes into this industry on purpose. Yeah. There's always some interesting story of how they got into it. Once you're in, you you do fall in love with it and realize, you know, I think insurance is just a magical invention that takes risk and makes it disappear. You know, you have companies that, you know, w- when we're dealing with um, so many different things that make money by giving you money, you know, it's mm-hmm. really kind of extraordinary. And um, but people that, that do it are, are just absolutely passionate about it. And I, I think one of the most interesting things, which is the questions you're asking, Norm, is why are you in this particular space? And, and I, I think it's always the most interesting question to ask anybody that you meet, um, because there's always a there's always a story. You know, I didn't you know. You, you meet actuaries like Elena's roommate. Yeah, that, that, those folks exist. And that's awesome. But for the rest of us, we've never heard of it, didn't know it existed and have some strange story as to how it happened. Yep. Yeah. And we all feel very lucky to have, you know, kind of fallen into it. So, um, is that your, you know, is that your story too, Norm? Uh, I fell into this. Yes. You did. You know, I fell into uh, the recruiting field. I just happened to get hired by the hospital software team and eventually kind of, you know, moved my way into the employee benefits and health plan sponsored technology space. And, uh, uh-huh. Feel very fortunate for that, and it's a space well, I, I love. I will say, I know you've got really questions, enjoy. but the only thing I want to say, Norm, is that you've built a um, not just a reputation for yourself, but you know, you've you've found amazing people out there okay. uh, in your in your network and the people that you know. And and I would say, anyone who I meet that knows you, I, I know they're a good person. Yeah, well, thank you. Really I appreciate that. Me. We take a lot of pride in uh, connecting, you know, some of the best leadership folks who have just amazing visions, you know, and surrounding them with the right talent to be able to execute on that vision. And uh, we don't take that lightly. We know when we're successful, clients are successful, and then ultimately the patient ends up getting better care. And that's what we care about. And that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. Um, So Evan, walk me through when you started at Best Doctors, you were in network development. So you were out there building relationships with probably world-renowned physicians to do some yep. of these expert second medical opinions. Um, you know, you obviously did well enough to get promoted into, you know, COO and president. Kind of walk us through the early uh, grunt work and then, you know, moving into leadership and kind of how that evolved. Yeah, you know, the, the stories of these entrepreneurial stories always are not linear. Okay. Yeah. Like it looks like it was the simple progression. Um, but you know, at, at the time at the company there had, you know, it was during the dot com era and there were all mm-hmm. kinds of people throwing all kinds of money in any kind of business that would do something that had a dot com at the end of it. Mm-hmm. And um this company under the management team that was there before was was doing one of those things. And so the the shift from being involved in contracting with providers to being in, in the executive leadership with a, with a partner, the, the two of us really built this business, was because of the realization that you couldn't solve these very complicated medical problems, diagnostic problems, treatment problems with a technology tool. That you really needed people 
that could understand what was going on, that could put the pieces together and then come up with solutions. You know, to be sure there's, there's technology that enables that. Uh, and, and it's a critically important thing to have those tools increasingly over time as the technology has become more useful. Um, but the, the challenge that, uh, that, that we experienced back in the late nineties there and early, you know, certainly in the early two thousands was this notion that, um, that a lot of people still believe in, which is you can use technology to solve fundamentally human problems and you, you simply can't. I mean, uh, the analogy I could use, cause I, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm, I have a perspective on this from the standpoint mm -hmm. of healthcare, but it would be as if you could say, Hey, you don't, I don't need, uh, I don't need norm to find me the best possible leaders, as you said, to, to mm -hmm. you know, surround a, a leading team and to, to build success. I can just use an app that I can put in, hey, I'm looking for a person that has this particular set of backgrounds and skills. The app will send me a bunch of names and I'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not, that's not real. That's not people the way things tried. work. People have tried. So, yes. since yet, you know, beginning of time, people have tried sure. to uh, duplicate what me and my peers, you know, do on a daily basis. Haven't happened yet, but you never know. One day that's it may what, be obsolete. That was, that was really the story of, of Best Doctors was saying, how do you take the fact that you need expert humans to, to integrate information and do judgments with technology, you can help them do that even better. And um, we had a lot of success doing that at Best Doctors. And, and the super cool thing about building a business today is that the technology is a lot better than, than it was and allows for a lot of uh, enablement in ways that are that are fantastic. Uh, but still, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you need people. Yeah, that's great. Um, Elena, walk me through your 20 years as a you know consultant. Um, you know, talking about the early 2000s at Mercer till, you know, the last, um, you know, couple of years, you know, at Willis, 20 years later, kind of walk me through how the, you know, landscape has changed. I would imagine there was not vendor fatigue in the uh, early 2000s. I could say with certainty there is now. Um, so kind of yes. walk me through that progression. Yeah, a, a history of healthcare a little bit. And so I'd say... What I see driving change over time is typically reactionary to the regulatory and the economic environment. Um, mm -hmm. So when I joined Mercer in the early 2000s, um, it was as a split role supporting kind of general health and benefit plan management. So doing strategies that design cost modeling and projection for benefit programs, um, as well as supporting two very new specialty groups, one to manage pharmacy benefits. So that mm -hmm. was a, a new thing to, to look at benefit, pharmacy benefits separately. And the other to address health and productivity management. Um, so in the early 2000s, HMO plans were still common. Empl employers were still, uh, were starting to look at more strategies to manage costs. And this was by increasing co-pays and deductibles and PPO plans. And yeah. then starting to carve pharmacy out to pharmacy benefits managers instead of having that be with the health plan. Um, so that was innovation in the early 2000s. That was, that was yes. like the new hot thing. All yes. right. And also add on to that health savings accounts um, mm -hmm. that came along and there was a lot of discussion around consumerism and health plans and would shifting more costs to employees make them better consumers? And I think in hindsight, we can say fairly easily know that it raised a lot of issues around affordability and delaying care. Um, and then the other angle to consider that was managing costs and how do we prevent claims in the first place, which paved the way for a lot of the lifestyle management and disease management and case management programs. Um, so I got to be on the front line of developing business cases and financial models and RFPs and intellectual capital with very brilliant leaders and large employers all over the country on what is the ROI of wellness programs. Um, so the early 2000s, then came the idea of incentives, um, mm -hmm. which would they drive behavior change? Um, we spent a lot of time evaluating the right incentives and whether or not they were effective at getting people engaged in programs and driving behavior change. Um, I'd say the next, next big thing was Medicare Part D and HIPAA High Tech. Um, it, then employers kind of shifted their attention to considering whether they continue retiree medical mm -hmm. um, and really taking a deep dive at data security practices. Um, then I'd say the economic crisis of, of 2008 was mm -hmm. a huge exercise in evaluating um, like what are the foundational benefit offerings what is effective in driving value for an organization and for employees. So 
um, I'd say there was more and more adoption of hydrogen health plans and cost shifting, um, which was an unfortunate time for employees who were financially struggling um, mm -hmm. and really started growing that gap of affordable care. Um, then we had uh, ACA, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act of 2010. Um, that was probably one of the broadest reforms with the biggest impacts over the last 20 years. And um, there was a huge, huge collective effort of health plans and employers to redesign plans and understand cost implications of the new mandates. And um, some of that was increasing coverage of dependents up to age 26. There was a ban on exclusion of pre-existing conditions and lifetime limits and expansion of preventive care. I think a lot of things that we take advantage of um, being part of the plans that we have today. And then the biggest elephant was really kind of the mandated coverage. And there was a lot of questions around what's the long-term role of employers in providing health care and how long could employers sustain the cost of providing care. Um, and then where we've seen that gone, I think is more pressure back on prevention of and effectively managing chronic conditions and this surge of health tech companies to manage musculoskeletal, diabetes, cancer, you know, smartly all of the top spend chronic conditions for employers. Um, and then looking at utilization and clinical management for specialty medicine. So um, th that additional spend put more pressure on providing ROI or BOI value on investment. And we saw a surge in leveraging data and data warehouses for more rigorous evaluation of utilization and outcomes. Um, and then we have 2020, the, the difficult events of the pandemic and George Floyd's murder, um, which shone a light on inequities in healthcare and racial injustice. Um, it brought all of us into each other's homes to see the challenges of caregiving. And it really had a lasting impact on mental health and physical health, health that I, I don't know that we've fully, fully appreciated yet. Um, and and I, you have a front row seat to it because you live in Minneapolis. Like you live yes. at the epicenter of like all of that. So you, your perspective is just, uh, very unique. Felt felt it in magnitudes, absolutely. Um, and and these activities really drove everyone and employers to prioritize diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, we saw employers looking at inclusive talent and rewards offerings. Mental health has been a big um, a big focus, and then adjusting to new ways of working. And I think today. We are in such a dynamic time of high employment and un uncertain economic environment that employers are really struggling with this balance of cost management and attracting and retaining employees. Um, and I'd say I, benefits haven't been designed for this newest and largest group of employees, Gen Z and millennials, and mm -hmm. there's a big need to modernize benefits and that these generations, we were talking about this yesterday, these generations also care about the value and actions of the employers they work for. So it poses a good question and challenge to employers. So what is your organization value proposition and what benefits bring the most value to the people that work there? Well, the evolution of innovation from the early 2000s to now is just light years ahead. So it's pretty cool that you got to see that and, uh, you know, you were able to share with our audience, you know, how much, you know, this industry has really moved forward. Evan, you know, you, I would say Best Doctors when you were there was one of the earlier innovators in the like point solution market, um, best to breed, you know, technology that really, you know, is an amazing carve out, you know, from the typical health plan coverage. So kind of walk us through like what the environment was for innovative technology in the mid to 2010 timeframe and how that's evolved through now. Yeah, the the thing about um, selling and innovating something like we really pioneered expert medical opinion mm -hmm. best doctors. In fact, you know, a couple of years after um, Best Doctors was sold, I was at the JP Morgan conference and I was talking to the CEO of, of one of our former competitors. And he said, you really, you guys really pioneered EMO. And, and I, I was like, what, what's EMO? <laughs> and he said, expert medical opinion. I'd never heard that, that acronym yeah. at that point. 
But, you know, back when we were starting in, in 2010, if I'd said I'm doing expert medical opinion, people wouldn't know what that was. If I said it was second opinion, I'd say, you mean go see another doctor and say, no, 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 we're doing this whole thing. And so the, mm -hmm. the problem was at that time is getting people to understand even what you're selling and why it should matter to them. And yep. it took time, you know, very interestingly. And this is, a, a, I think, a comment on on the way that people perceive healthcare it was easier for us to sell that kind of service to people outside the united states than it is inside the united states yeah and the perception among people outside of the us who have terrific different systems of healthcare is that you know the top experts in medicine are you know more commonly found in the United states i want access to those folks if i'm facing a serious illness whereas in the united states our perspective is no i got everything i need here and, yeah. um, you know, we're, they're, they're both wrong. You know, I mean, there's great physicians and, and hospitals everywhere. And, um, and also in the United States, we've got huge issues that are, that are, you know, that get in the way of getting the right care. And so our challenge was how do you make sure people understand the need and that the fact that what we do actually addresses it and works. Um, the technology aspect, if you go back that long ago, it was not, it, it wasn't what people were looking for. They were looking for, you know, a, a way to control healthcare costs. You know, as Elena was pointing out, that's always been the theme. Um, although I have my own theory, which is that, you know, basically since the 1970s, people have been saying that healthcare spending is unsustainable. Um, when it's been a half century, at a certain point, you say, I guess, I guess it is somehow sustainable. And we we yeah. may not like the way that it's that it's being spent and whose pockets it's coming out of, but it, it obviously is something that people want. Um, and 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 people you know seek to benefit from. So, but I think anytime you're building something that hasn't existed before, you run into that challenge of need to explain it. You know, it's a lot easier if you can show up and say, "Hey, I've got an EMO solution." Everybody knows what EMO is. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, it's a lot harder when you're trying to build something from scratch. But to me, those are the fights worth fighting. You know, create something that doesn't exist that needs to exist, and and then convince people that you know they need to join in. Yeah, grand rounds now included health. Consumer Medical, Second MD, There's, they all benefited from, you know, you guys kind of paving the way. So, yeah. And, and, and yes. And to more to the point, like, I think that it has helped transform the way in which people think about having a diagnosis and mm -hmm. think, you know, I've always felt and I feel this way about what we're doing at Family First that our enemy uh, as, as a business, my like sworn enemy is people's fear and doubt and and feelings that they shouldn't ask for help in a situation because, and you want to show people that there's a way to do this. And I think that, you know, helping people understand that misdiagnosis and incorrect treatment are common mm -hmm. um, and that there's nothing wrong with asking questions and, and highlighting the issue that doctors don't have enough time with their patients. Mm -hmm. you know, now we, we see it, you know, as a, as an aside here and what we move from a caregiving perspective at family first, because you have those issues that you layer on top of it, how fragmented it is to actually care for somebody. Mm -hmm. And it creates this very, you know, uh, unpleasant cycle that, that needs to be interrupted. What was the team like at Best Doctors, you know, in your first maybe two to three years? It was, it was awesome because it was a group of people that really believed in the cause. I mean, in a lot of ways, it was the foundation of what we built over time. They really, really believed in the cause. This was like every single person is entitled to get the right diagnosis and treatment, to know they've got the right diagnosis and treatment if they do. And we're going to run through walls, do everything it takes to get this thing done. And we would be there. You know, we had one of our uh, leading people would uh, literally, if, if folks were coming to the U.S. for care, she would go meet them at the airport if they were coming to Boston oh, and take them wow. to their hotel. Yeah, because she really wanted to make sure um, that they that they had everything they they needed, and the stories were what kept us going. You know, we were always sharing stories at every one of our meetings about people that that we had helped and what the impact was on those folks. The testimonials we would see, and it was a team that was just deeply motivated, you know, by mm -hmm. that cause. Again, when when you're building something that doesn't exist and needs to exist, having that kind of a team with you is it's I don't know. You you, you there is there's you can't do it otherwise, or you can, no. but it ain't going to be the same. Every, many people that I've had on this show, especially the commercially focused folks, which some of them have been uh, already featured in the podcast, some haven't been um, published yet, but will be before, you know, yours will be. So I would say the top commercial minds that I've had on the podcast, Julie Stadelbauer from Progeny, 
uh, Manny Menendez from Consumer Medical, who I'm sure was a thorn in your side, you know, at certain points in Absolutely. time. Good, good, good people. Good competition. Uh, Sean McBride over at Lyra. And you just mentioned it, like storytelling is so huge. Like every company I've ever come across that's had an amazing success story from an outcome standpoint, ultimately had a great story to tell. So mm -hmm. whether it's salespeople watching this podcast or sales leaders or founders that are trying to, you know, sell their first couple of customers before they even grow a commercial team, anyone ever asks like, what's your first thing, you know, piece of advice? Um, to help me, you know, create a stellar sales pitch. It's telling a great story. You know, if yeah. you can do that, all the other things might fall into place. But if you don't have that, like, you're not really getting out of the start. It's it, you know, we we live in a very cynical time. And mm -hmm. um, if you go to raise money, if you talk to clients, even everybody is looking for you know, just show me the margins I want to see. Um, show me, you know, tell me what your catch is. You know, if you're talking to mm -hmm. to to prospects, sometimes like yeah. Can you really call for anything? Yes. Like, don't mm -hmm. you stop at a certain point? No. And, you know, it makes it really easy to because what you're doing is not so much selling as you are sharing the mm -hmm. news about this thing that exists and that you really want the other person to have because you know it's going to help. Um, and in a world in which that is sometimes not rewarded, you know, because investors are like, yeah, yeah, yeah hear the story. That sounds like that's going to eat into your margins. And so I'm not really interested in that. Tell me about yeah. exactly. This works and you're going to flip it and sell it to somebody else. It's fine. And you can, you can do well that way and you can make a nice business and, and you can make a leg. Just a question of how important to you is having meaning and purpose and impact. Uh, and, you know, for me, the best people, the best people are the ones who want those three things. That's who I want to work with. Yep. Elena, you know, it's usually seen as though consultants have to be that devil's advocate. They have to be a little cynical you know, going into meetings with vendors. Um, so I'm curious, number one, you know, how much of that were you doing for your clients and your team, like vetting solutions and making sure that they actually work compared to what the claims are made? And just out of curiosity, were you ever that devil's advocate with, you know, Evan and his team at Best Doctors? Did you guys know each other back then? Or, you know, when did you guys meet? Um, so to answer your first question, yes, I would say my job as a consultant was to look for problems and to find yeah. solutions around them. Yes. So there was a lot of looking under every rock around every corner for what was the catch? What's the value? Mm -hmm. um, how does how does this work as a as a member experience? I um I would say answer your second question. I knew Evan. I don't know if Evan knew me and that's understandable. You, we, but knew we, know you, each we, other now. we knew you by reputation, Elena, <laughs> without a doubt. Oh, Definitely knew you. Yeah, yeah you, you, one comment on that, Norm, is that living in the in the post pandemic world that uh, that Elena alluded to, the the current state of work is that you can live and work anywhere in the world, and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, Elena's mm -hmm. in in Minneapolis or near Minneapolis, and I'm in the Boston area, and we really don't focus on having people come into an office or anything. We do is we get mm -hmm. our team together very regularly, um, in 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 a different city and meet and do strategic planning and these other things. And it's, it's remarkable how companies can develop that way. It actually means that you can do so much more than otherwise would be possible when you're limited mm -hmm. by geography. And I'm sure you see that from a recruiting perspective, but I, oh. I think we're just living in a time oh, where nice. the impact of that, you know, the productivity impact of having video calls and no commuting and all this stuff and less travel uh, and, and more engagement with people, I think, is something that is is a major trend over the next number of years that's that's we, we, we aren't accounting for yet. I yeah. remember having friendly but heated discussions with my uh, you know, good friend and client, Dan Perez at Hinge, about whether customer success managers needed to live in San Francisco, despite their clients possibly being on the East Coast. So, you know, it's funny how that has evolved and changed with many, you know, of my clients and founders, um, you know, that have had in the past requirements pre 2020 of, Hey, this, these positions need to be in the office. And now like how that's, you know, softened quite a bit. It's uh, you know, funny from my perspective, for sure. For sure. So, Lena, yeah. um, a lot of people watching this are either trying to sell to brokers and consultants work closely with brokers and consultants. There's no way around it. There's vendor fatigue. There's a lot of skepticism. What's your advice to vendors that want to work collaboratively with brokers and consultants? Like, what are the, hey, 
these are the to do's to, you know, stay on our good side. And here are the don't do's, you know, that typically will put you in a, uh, you know, group of companies that you don't want to be in. Advice I'd give to groups starting out is to, to love your problem. Um, you've created a solution because you've seen a need and you've seen a problem. So before you jump to the solution, um, you really explore every angle of who you're making it for, um, how people use it, what experience you want people to come away with, and how you know if it's successful and what you want people to say about it. So I think that we talked about, you know, making sure that you have a story around what you're delivering. What are don't do's? So spending too much time on your problem. So I I was recently talking to a potential partner and they had 10 plus slides on the prevalence of their issue. Um, and I, I think people people know what problems exist around. So you don't need to spend a lot of time on the problem, on the, yeah. you know, who's the, who's the bad guy. Um, then not communicating your solutions, uh, goals and outcomes. So what's in it for the employer and how do you mm -hmm. achieve that? And then again, I think it's just a missed opportunity to tell a real story because that brings to life the member experience and mm -hmm. demonstrates your differentiators and outcomes. And then it's something that I, as a broker or consultant, can take along and retell the value of what you're bringing to clients and prospects. And it's it's also a really great place to infuse your data. So what are those data points I'm going to hang on about what's effective and what you're what you're delivering? I love that. Um, so Evan, when you joined Best Doctors, um, you know, they were doing a good amount of business outside the US. It sounds like the US was a little bit slow to like adopt that type of solution. So kind of talk about what were some of the major challenges of turning around the business, you know, at Best Doctors, and then ultimately leading to the extraordinary growth, you know, and ultimately the acquisition by Teladoc that I think was probably the highest profile like acquisition slash merger probably prior to the Lavongo merger with Teladoc a handful of years ours, later. Ours, ours worked out better. Um, yep. but, but look, it's, it, it is, it is all about finding that product market fit, you know, and if you're, if you're talking to a U.S. employer um, that have these cycles of benefits that they're going to put in over periods of time mm -hmm. and it's a strategy and they're dealing with what they were dealing with in those early, you know, kind of early to mid to early to mid kind of two thousands, where, you know, kind of the, the early days of data, you know, data analytics and, and disease management and all those kinds of things that were out there that everybody was focused on because it was, you know, all of them were going to deliver so much ROI that healthcare was going to become a profit center, it seemed to me. Um, and then you show up with something that says, okay, listen, you know, you've got significant number of your cancer cases aren't properly characterized. And so people are getting treatments that aren't going to work and we can prevent that from happening. Um, and we have a way of doing that. You know, it's sort of like that sounds really good, but like it's not on our roadmap. At a certain point, you know, you spend enough time doing it, you get enough scale and and data, which we were generating so much of from the clients that we had and in, in you know Europe and in Canada and all over Latin America and in Japan and Australia, um, and, and you know, it became pretty compelling. You know, and I, I think you know when you when you listen to Elena talk, you know, so thoughtfully about what it means to to get into that ecosystem, you, you're, you're talking to some really smart people who are, you know, they're going to say, oh, that really sounds good. And I love your story, but mm -hmm. I need, you know, I, I need data that demonstrate the value of what this is. Um, we were able to do that very effectively, um, you know, certainly on the level of individual cases where you could show this is what was happening and this is where it got changed. Mm -hmm. And then in the aggregate where you could start to show that kind of an impact on, on the people. Um, it's something that we really take to heart, you know, now because of that experience. I mean, mm -hmm. this, there is a value to having been in these battles previously. Um, employers are more sophisticated now than they've, than they've ever been when it comes to these things. Yep. And so the opportunity for, for anybody who's selling things to employers is to get real sophisticated quickly about your data um, and, and to show the impact of your, of your work. Um, that gets people's attention more than, more than almost anything. Great. And tell me what you're most proud about in, you know, ultimately getting best doctors to an exit. It's, it's the, it's the stories, you know, mm -hmm. it's the stories. I mean, look, the exit was, was great for, um, for everybody really. 
Um, but, you know, when I think about or talk about best doctors, it's always the stories, you know, the, the case of the, you know, woman who we helped who was being treated for lung cancer and wasn't getting better. And she was seeking out help to find another doctor and another hospital to solve her lung cancer. But we were able to figure out that actually she had a metastatic thyroid cancer. And so the reason she wasn't getting better was because she was taking treatment that was not meant for the disease she had, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. You hear that you're like, I can't believe that that happened, although I know it does. And I can't believe we had the opportunity to help her and she had a, a good outcome. That kind of thing is what, you know, I, you know, if I, if I want to tell my kids, this is what I do. You know, I want to tell them a story like that one. I'm not a doctor. You know, I've been around medicine long enough to have a, an understanding of what goes on, but I know that it's really important to ask questions. I learned something that helps me enormously in business, um, which is to make sure you understand the nature of the problem before you rush to solve it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, you know, given people's expectations in so many areas that you're just going to make quick decisions, you better make sure you're making the right decision, you know, before mm -hmm. you do it. But th this is the old, these are these old sayings that we forget, like a stitch in time saves nine or measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in, in human, you know, human nature is such that we forget those things. And, and, you know, it's so I, I feel like the lessons from best doctors and the things that I'm proud of have everything to do with the people that we help, um, everything to do with the way of thinking about problems, everything to do with uh, how you can really make a, a huge impact on a large number of people in a way that's, um, you know, that, that you feel just feel good about. I love that. Elena, you had 20 plus years, you know, on the broker consultant side of the house. You achieved a ton in that space, like running North America for DEI is a big deal. And then, you know, now in the vendor world, what are some of the guiding principles that you've followed in your career that's gotten you to this point? Yeah, I, so I, I spent 20 years trying to solve for and design programs that keep employees healthy and productive at work um, and really think family first is the solution. So time over time, I saw initiatives or programs not meeting the mark and encouraged employers I work with to go on site and talk with the employees um, that were that were needing the programs. And I was fortunate to join a couple of clients to do that um, road trip around Michigan one summer mm -hmm. to, to visit production facilities. Um, and I learned that programs were not meeting the mark because of the communities or work policies or other personal barriers that existed. Um, and we were solving them, the barriers existed and we were trying to solve them really to effectively engage the people. Being respectful of other people and listening are a couple of my guiding principles. Um, what led me then to join and eventually leave the DEI practice under which felt workforce support and caregiving. Um, I learned more about the caregiving space and then I started hearing it more and more and the challenges and the challenges that colleagues and friends and families were facing every day. And they're very complicated, difficult, time consuming and emotional challenges. And I realized that caregiving is probably one of the most significant and under-recognized barriers. And after I had done all of that listening, it was like, it's so hard to see in the data, but it impacts so many people. Um, and so that, you know, through the DEI work, I got to know family first. I was very impressed with the model. Um, I heard so many impactful stories that were life-changing ways that care experts are uncovering and solving the impossible for caregivers. And I, I wanted to be part of making family first available to the world. And part of that was just another one of my values is integrity and curiosity. And that is, that is what the family first team is doing. It's, Mm -hmm. being a trusted expert that delivers all of the time um, and and um, really will go to the ends of the world to help people. Yeah, I find it fascinating in my very, you know, unique perspective when like a very well-known um, broker or, or consultant of influence joins a vendor because those groups, you know, those types of people look under the hood at hundreds, maybe thousands of companies. So when they go to an organization, it just is like the ultimate validation that like this company, this software, this technology, this program works because again, they've seen everything and they felt compelled to join that mission. So that really goes a long way. Um, and I think it says a lot, you know, about the quality of the technology and service 
whenever, you know, someone with your background joins, you know, full time as opposed to just spending a small chunk of their day with that organization. Um, you know, Evan, you've had a fascinating career. Um, you know, you've been running for, you know, office, you've been a um attorney, you've been, you know, an executive within software companies. What are some of your guiding principles that's allowed you to achieve success in a multitude of different arenas? You you, you got to start with knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Independent of what words I can put on, on different principles and values. But if you know what makes you feel fulfilled and happy, um, you can go a long way if you can pursue that. Now, it's not always easy, you know, because you sometimes do have to make compromises because, hey, I need to pay the bills. And mm -hmm. um, and so the question is always, how do you find a way to, to make the most of that and be in the right kind of setting where you want to be in? Um, I think one of the great things that's happened certainly in the last 10 to 15 years in, in our economy is just that the idea of leaving a job and going to another job at a certain point was was seen as like, you don't do that. Um, <laughs> and nowadays it's like, no, I, I can do that. I don't, you know, why'd you leave? I didn't like it there. That's a totally fine answer in, in, in an interview. In a bit, whereas before you'd have to have some story of, well, you know, there was this going on and they made this happen and this happened and I, I really had no choice. Um, you can say, I didn't like it there. Here's what I didn't like. And you've got the ability to do that. I think that's amazing. And it's a gift. Mm -hmm. And um, it's why I, I commend anybody who, if a recruiter calls you, take the call and just talk to them. You know, you never know where, where it leads. You require my friend. I'm telling you, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. It opens up a, a door you didn't know existed. And, and I look and I, you know, when I listen to Elena talk um, with the amount of experience and capabilities that she has, you know, the fact that she could work anywhere. She already had an amazing job at WTW. I mean, an amazing oh. job at a senior level doing really remarkable things. She says, I want to come here. You know, that to me is, is like, how'd that happen? That's amazing. You know, that feels like we're, we're doing something good. Other people see that and they want to be part of it too. So for me, it's creating something that speaks to you, your core, who you are. And that means spending time working on that, you know, talk to a therapist, talk to a coach, you know, figure out what makes you, you know, tech so that you can have a, an organization that is just genuine. It's just you. It's just who you are. It feels good. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like it, it's work, but it feels like you're doing something that you believe in and that you're looking forward to doing and that you, you can't imagine not doing that. That to me is, is what it's, what it's about. Yeah. I think the people that, uh, you know, really got it right are the people that don't dread afternoons on Sundays. You know, yes. there's certain people that are like, Oh no, like, I'm like Sundays, like one of my favorite days because like there's nothing I'm not looking forward to on Monday. Like, yeah, I right. get to spend more time with my family and we have great time, but like I like work also, you know, and that's not something uh, that a lot of people have. And you know, I love it's a gift norm giving other I mean, people that feeling. I, look, when I when I was a uh, when I was a lawyer, and this goes back a long time in the '90s, the idea that I that anybody should feel fulfilled in their job was not on the list. You yeah. know, it was like, you need to go and build 2,700 hours. You need to do an spectacular job and exceed expectations every mm -hmm. single time. And you don't need to go home, you know? So like, let's, let's stay focused here. But the idea of, well, what about, what about me? You're like, I'm sorry. Did I, did I mention that? You know? And mm -hmm. it, and it was, you know, it, it was a way of living and working that was very common and it still exists today in many organizations. Uh, but again, for the to, for the younger uh, generations, the, the folks like you and, and Elena, that, and Elena mentioned this about that that new um, generation of, of, of workers, they want that. And you know what? It's a good thing. It's a mm -hmm. good thing. And companies need to pay attention to that and provide that. Yeah, I remember my like soundtrack of dread as a young child was the uh, you know stopwatch clicking of sixty minutes. It's like. <laughs> School's over. about to start. When you hear that, like, click, 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 and then it's like, did you do your homework? Like, are yep. you ready for the day? You know, Monday. Um, I, I was a good student. I got good grades. I had great friends. But, like, I didn't love school. The structure just, like, you know, it was a little too constricting for me. Definitely yep. glad I, you know, ended up being an entrepreneur and working in a more entrepreneurial business. I probably wouldn't have been a great corporate employee. Uh, but... Um, you know, I think that's funny now, like I watched 60 minutes and it doesn't give me any heightened anxiety or dread. <laughs> um, so it was just purely like a, that's a big know, step school, for your norm. Yeah. school <laughs> morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, Evan, you know, walk me through, you know, why you joined and started with family first. 
Um, you know, that was right after your, uh, you know, run for governor. And then, you know, walk me through um, how your experience at Best Doctors has better positioned you to succeed here. Yeah, it's it's everything. I mean, you know, I mentioned that my father had, had started uh, Best Doctors and, mm-hmm. and, you know, sadly, in sort of the 2010 time period, he started to have a, a lot of significant health issues. Tragically, he was misdiagnosed by some leading physicians at a leading hospital. Um, and it was a very difficult thing to go through. And, you know, I, I live here in Boston. My siblings don't live in the area. You know, my mom was running at the time this massive organization called Hadassah and was traveling all over the world. And so in many ways, I became my dad's primary caregiver. Um, and it was really hard. It was really hard. I mean, that was happening, you know, while I was working at Best Doctors. It was happening when I was running for governor. It was happening when I was building a political party. You know, he passed away ultimately in 2018. But the the process of caring for him felt impossible. Impossible. Mm-hmm. Family dynamics, medical issues, the practical stuff, you know, what's going on? What do we do about it? Every, everything. You know, did anybody have the proper you know, planning in place. Anybody have a healthcare proxy? You know, what's the, is there an advance, any of this stuff? Um, I had the good fortune of meeting um, someone that was a, there's a type of professional out there called a geriatric care manager that helps mm-hmm. families in these situations that I'd never heard of. And I've been in healthcare for a long time. And I, I got introduced to her and I said, I'm completely lost. I don't know what to do. Here's what's going on with my dad. This is what's happening. I need help. And she was like, just slow down. Um, how are you doing? It's like, how, how am I doing? Um, and I said, you know, n- not great. And she said, well, tell me, you know, what's hard. And we had a nice conversation. And then she said, tell me about your father. Not about, I don't need to hear all the story. I need to tell me about him, who he is. Mm-hmm. And she was able to help me have a clarity of thought and then come up with a plan as to what to do. And it was extraordinarily helpful to me and to my family. And from that experience, I was just like, this caregiving feels impossible. Sometimes it is. I met a person who knows how to help people in that situation. I'd never heard of it. This needs to exist. And this this is a problem bigger than what we had addressed, been addressing at Best Doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, it felt very personal, and it was. And I was like, this, it, and it didn't exist in a, in a way that was available to millions of people for free. It was expensive to work with one of these people. Yeah. Um, I said, this is what we did at Best Doctors, but it's much bigger and much more impactful. Mm-hmm. And and I, I need to create this. And so that's when I that's why I started it. Um, much like with Best Doctors, you go to people and employers and insurers in kind of 2016, 2017, 2018 time period, 2019. Hey, I got this awesome thing that helps caregivers. Like that sounds really nice. It's not on our roadmap. Like it's not a big issue for us right now. And, you know, you, the things I learned from best doctors was you got to, you got to persevere through that. You just got to keep going. You got to pivot and be creative and figure out a way to keep the lights on and and grow the business, which we did. We were scrappy, uh, had a team of people just like in the early days that just believed. And, you know, when the pandemic happened and all the shifts that, that, uh, Elena mentioned caregiving got on the roadmap and, you know, by 2021, it was becoming a thing. Um, and that's when we started really. Yeah, and we really started to go at it. And again, you look now at all the people on our team that have that that same passion and belief in this cause that are here and they could work anywhere, and yet they're they're here with us. Um, that is motivating. And and I'll tell you that one of the things I experienced is that any entrepreneur experiences as their company grows and scales is that mm-hmm. things start moving really fast. And and part of it is because you've got really amazing people. And if you're doing a good job as an executive, your job is, this is what I think my job is, is to help everybody on this team be as successful as they can possibly be. That's my like number one role. Yep. Um, and what I really want that to look like is that every person who works here says, this is the greatest job I've ever had in my life. Yeah. And I, that's, that's what gets, you know, you said what gets you up in the morning. That's what gets mm-hmm. me up in the morning. How do I, how do I do that? Um, and, um, it's and great that's, North star. It really is. Yeah. Thanks. That's amazing. So recently, the family first secured a Series A of $11 million, uh, at the end of July from EOS Ventures. Uh, EOS Venture Partners, right. RPM Ventures, and Wormhole Capital uh, mm-hmm. supported us in our, in our Series A raise. Um, this is the – I've been out raising money you know, from venture and private equity for a long, long time. This mm-hmm. is the worst market 
I've ever seen. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, like, talk to me about in this environment, like walk me through that process. How did you guys get funding at a point where a lot of companies are struggling to? I think there's a model that's existed for the last, say, 15 years where money has basically been, you know, from from a government lending perspective, free. And so there's been a ton of money pumped into venture capital. And a lot of models that got funded would get huge amounts of money for some solution that would burn a lot of cash, get to a certain size, you'd get someone else to put in some more money, and eventually someone maybe buys it or it gets merged into something or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that was a model. And what shifted, you know, um, when they started raising interest rates, that all of a sudden investors had to look for real businesses, Mm -hmm. not things that could create this financial engineering kind of outcome. And um, so if you're if if you're in the middle of that shift, okay, and and you show up with the usual thing everybody sees, I've got a technology that's going to change the world by automating how we buy X or automating the way that we address this big societal issue. And I've got an awesome uh, app and AI solution that will will help do that. Well, that would get funded circa 2021, 2020, Mm -hmm. 2023 or 2022. It's not, it's not, I need to see something substantive and real. It's been hard for many investors to make that shift. Um, The ones that invested in us were always doing that, which is one of the things Mm -hmm. that I just, when I met both uh, EOS, RPM, all three of them and, and wormhole, it struck me that these were very substantive people that yeah. we're looking for a real business that has a real impact in the real world. And that's what their experience has been with the companies they've invested in. And um, so it just resonated. I, mean, I talked to so many investors that were looking for that kind of magical thing. And I was like, this isn't going to work for us. And finally found um, this this syndicate. So they are hugely value added, I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. We're raising money. I think one of the most important things to do is to recognize these are your new business partners. And um, you want to make sure you find people that you you resonate with, that share your vision, that want to you know achieve the same kinds of things that you do. We all want to build big, valuable companies. And it's a question of of doing it in a way that's substantive and real, which is where we're focused, and and that's I think what distinguishes us from from so many other businesses. What other tips or advice would you give founders looking to raise you know a new round of funding in twenty twenty three or twenty twenty four? You know, uh, <laughs> number one is be resilient. Mm-hmm. Um, number two is really have your story. I mean, the, the, some of the stuff is basic. Have your story really good and tight. So it's very clear mm-hmm. where you're going, and how you're going to get there. Um, I think the big mistake that a lot of folks make now, um, because they, they may not realize how much the market has shifted, is that if you're going to show a business model that involves you burning $15 million a year to get to your goals, um, you're going to have a hard time getting funded. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so you, you need to show something that shows that you're disciplined about how you're spending your money and you've got a clear roadmap for how you're going to become, you know, cash flow mm-hmm. positive and profitable. Um, and you know, that's not easy for, for a lot of folks. And, um, but it's, it, it, but there's a massive opportunity in so many different dimensions of our market right now. I'm not just talking about caregiving. I'm talking about healthcare, digital health. Um, so many other areas, if you can mm-hmm. show how you can, in a disciplined way, build an amazing business, you will get funded. I, you know, wholeheartedly believe, you know, that the team you and your leadership team built at Best Doctors was world class. And Thanks. I believe right now the team you're building, you know, Lena being a huge part of that is world class at Family First. Like, what would you say you look for in folks joining a growth stage company, you know, sometimes called a startup. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what are some of your guiding principles on, um, you know, building teams? Um, The number one thing is, is the, is the fit, the person's Mm -hmm. fit in the organization. And for me, what that looks like is that you really got to believe in, in what we do and why we do it, the why aspect of Mm -hmm. this, you know, we solve the impossible. We do. You know, that's the the sort of interesting thing about what we do. And and you need to be able to hear that and say, Oh, I'm I'm very I'm excited to be part of something like that. Okay, mm-hmm. we will run through walls to solve people's problems. We will do everything we can to figure out what's wrong and what to do about it. We share stories, we're inspired by them. Right. And you notice I've I've talked nothing about someone's resume. You know, if, if I'm no. talking to you normally, like I need someone that's gonna hear that and say, I'm really interested in this. Um, and then you can look at their resume and their skills. And there's a lot of people that are really great out there. But, you know, again, as a as a CEO and the things that I look for, I need a team 
the company needs a team that shares those the same set of beliefs mm -hmm. and passion and values um, and and wants to help everybody else be successful. And that's the key. So that's what I look for above all else. And, and it's what it's about. Look, we have a lot of people on our team who are former best doctors folks, and it's because yep. they, they, they remember that and they want to be a part of that. We have a lot of people like Elena who have been, um, you know, tremendously successful in other areas who hear the same story and are like, I, I need to be a part of that. Um, that is a, is a self-reinforcing kind of thing. And it's how you build culture, but it, it requires discipline, focus, leadership, and, and overt attention to these issues. What I took from what you just said, um, and I, I do want to hear your perspective, Elena, but as long as I'm yeah. thinking about it, um, that is so important for candidates to think about when conducting yourself in an interview process. Unfortunately, Evan, with your company, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to out the person's name, but there was a candidate we had you guys really liked you know, for a sales position. And, you know, this individual was looking at a handful of companies and we kind of got to the end and your sales leader, Chad Yarman, reached out to me and said, hey, I think we want to make this gentleman an offer. I said, OK, great. Uh, and he's like, does he want it? I'm like, all right, let me call him. And he, you know, said, well, I like them, but I'm looking at two other companies and he was playing very coy and very hard to get. And, you know, ultimately you guys decided, hey, if like this isn't where he wants to be, we don't want to make him an offer. So like, I think it's a really insightful thing. Unfortunately, I believe he lost out on a, you know, rocket ship opportunity, but you know, when you're interviewing and when you're talking to companies, like show your cards, if you really are interested, tell them you're interested. This isn't, uh, you know, purely like dating where you want to, uh, you know, play completely hard to get even at the end of the process. I think there comes a point in time where you know, the company and the top talent has to be very honest with each other of, hey, like, I really see a strong fit this is where I want to be, you know, let's come to an agreement, you know, that's mutually beneficial. It's never a good idea to just say, well, I want to see three offers. And, you know, I'll, I'll make my decision from there that just comes off very transactional and very much like it's not about the mission. It's purely yeah, about financials. And I'll, I'll say, because I definitely also want to hear Elena's perspective on this, that I don't, I don't necessarily blame that person. Because I think in general, in a market where there's a lot of people that are just, they're, they're looking for a gig, and there's a lot of companies that are looking for someone who's going to work in a gig that's going to do this for two years, it works out great. If it doesn't, then it is what it is. You go find another gig. You know, if you're, 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 if, you're, if you're trying to maximize how much money you make and have some stability, go do that. But, you know, it's a mismatch, you know, and, and I think the, the real lesson from that is not so much, you know, how, what he did. You know, yeah, what he did didn't match what we wanted. Um, but it was really us knowing what we wanted, you know, yeah. it's because th that's a person's terrific resume and background interview as well. Um, but at the end of the day, that, that it was that missing piece. It's that, you know, it, it's that it's intangible. Discipline and it's yeah. adhering to your guiding principles. It's like, True. Hey, like, well, this is good, but like, we're going to stick to our guns because it's worked and you know, it's still it. become very successful. Elena, what were you going to share? I was going to add, Evan was talking about the experienced people we have on the team, but we, we also have a couple of highly successful people on the team who had zero background in healthcare mm -hmm. coming into this, but was they were just bringing the passion and drive that Evan was talking about. And I think they've, they've such a wonderful addition to the team too, because they have that passion and they ask really good questions that kind of help us pause because this caregiving, focus on caregiving is a new space. And I think it helps us better think about how we're going to the market and making sure that we're being clear in the value that we're bringing and how we're explaining what we do. So I, yeah, I, I, like you said, Evan, I think the passion is so important. Yeah. With the mission you guys have, it's not a shock that there's a lot of people um, that it resonates with and, you know, really yes. want to be a part of it. So um, at no surprise, but it's, you know, really great to see. So I ask everyone who joins this podcast, okay, we work in healthcare all day, but what do we do personally? How do we practice what we preach? Evan, with your Peloton in the background, I think there's going to be a little foreshadowing <laughs> to my question, but how do each of you participate in your own healthcare journey, whether that's physical health, mental health, emotional health? How do you incorporate health and wellness in your day-to-day -day that allows you to be you know, extremely productive at work? You can go first here. So. Um... I am a strong believer in the reality that there is no such thing as work-life balance. Now, 
what that means is all there is is life. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So you got to figure out how to put all those pieces together and what your life is. There aren't two different pieces. And, you know, for me, it's, you know, I, I spent a lot of time doing my own work on myself. You know, I, I love doing yoga. I, I work out with a trainer um, because that physical ties into your mental health. Uh, I spend time with my family as much as, as possible. Uh, although our kids are you know, already moved out and um, one is still at home. And um, yeah, I mean, it's the, like I said, the, it's, it's all about how do you holistically construct your life? And it's, it's a, it's always working. So I mean, the interest, I told you that. Um, but I can say that I, I know that it's a, it's a process and I'm going to keep working on it decades to come. Great. How about you, Elena? Um, spending quality time with friends and family is very important to reach, recharging and energizing me. Um, I volunteered for quite a bit in my early life and I just gave it a backseat as I was building up my career and um, got involved in that again. And I've been able to make such rich and wonderful relationships with the group that I volunteer with. Um, and then I'd say uh, making sure I'm getting enough sleep. So I spent a lot of my 20s and 30s thinking that four or five hours of sleep was enough, Whoa. Um, but it caught up with me in big, bad ways. And I know now that if I want to be at my best and focused and resilient, that the best thing I can do is making sure that I can get the best sleep possible. All right. That's fantastic. And then you know, I think obviously like what we're putting into our mouth, you know, is a huge um, determining factor of life expectancy and productivity and, you know, general health, any healthy recipes, you know, that you make with your families that are popular mm -hmm. that, you know, anyone trying to, you know, eat healthier might want to try out themselves. I, I love to cook and I'm always trying new recipes, um, but this time of year, as it's getting colder in the Midwest, I love soup and I have my favorite recipe is a Peruvian quinoa soup that has a ahi amarillo paste in it. And it's just such a nice, warming comfort food for me. Can you share that recipe? That I sounds delicious. Will. And I will try it. I <laughs> promise you. Yeah. It, you know, my, my wife is an amazing cook and has a, a remarkable uh, repertoire of, of, uh, of recipes that she does. I, I also find that grilling things, grilling yes. things is an amazing thing to do. And we do that year round here as well. And, um, you know, just um, whatever it might be, you can make anything interesting if you put it on a grill and it could mm -hmm. be real simple. You could grill some vegetables and mix it in with some pasta and, you know, pesto, and you've got a hell of a meal. Um, mm -hmm. Or you could, make a barbecue rub and put it on a chicken breast and you've got a real healthy thing that has a little zip to it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about enjoying things, but I'd much rather go out and have like a, a nice steak or, uh, you know, a dozen oysters or, um, a lobster. I don't know. I, ribs. <laughs> you're, as you said, whatever you put in your mouth has an impact on you, but what if it makes well, you whatever happy? you're doing works, yeah. you look like you're in yeah. great shape. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Elena and Evan, for joining me on the Digital Health Heavyweights podcast. Um, congrats on all your success at Family First and looking forward to more to come. So, again, thank you for stepping into the ring with me. And, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, continue doing what you're doing. It's amazing work. And, you know, we all in this industry, thank you for it. Thank you for joining. Please like, comment and subscribe below if you enjoyed it.